Late March 1918. The First World War has been dragging on for nearly four years, with millions dead. But the German army suddenly manages to pull off the seemingly impossible, launching a last massive offensive on the Western Front. Called the Kaiser's Battle, the Spring Offensive opens on the 21st of March 1918, after nearly 50 German divisions had been released from the Eastern Front following the peace of Brest-Litovsk that the Germans had made with the new Bolshevik government in Russia. Germany was running out of time and needed to win a decisive victory against the exhausted British Commonwealth and French armies before the United States, which had recently joined the conflict, could deploy huge, fresh forces on the front line. Using the new concept of stormtroopers, Operation Michael was the main attack, designed to pierce the front lines and outflank the British and defeat them, an event that would have brought the French to the negotiating table. But the offensive soon ground into stubborn resistance. Though some headway was made, logistical difficulties and determined Allied defences slowed the offensive. Many Germans were taken prisoner from the battles that followed. One soldier reported to his French captors that the German Emperor, Wilhelm II, was actually very close to the front lines. He had established a command post in a captured chateau just outside the French village of Trenon, three miles from the Belgian border. The prisoner's story was carefully checked by the French. In May 1918, as the Titanic struggle continued, the French sought the permission of the chateau's owner, who by a great coincidence was on Marshal Pétain's staff, to launch an attack on the house. He agreed, and the scene was set for one of the world's first surgical strikes in warfare, a deliberate targeting of an enemy head of state for assassination. By 1918, Kaiser Wilhelm II had been very effectively vilified in Britain, France and the US by Allied propaganda efforts. Some of it was of course true. The Emperor was a difficult, thin-skinned and rather inadequate man who had led his nation to war in 1914, after a long period of building up Germany's military and naval power. A grandson of Britain's famous Queen Victoria, Wilhelm was born with a withered left arm, a disability that he had tried to disguise and which caused him anxiety and affected his masculinity at a time when monarchs liked to portray themselves as the very epitome of the masculine warrior. In response, Wilhelm became obsessed with uniforms, the army and his prize navy and placed Germany on a collision course with the world's number one superpower, Great Britain. Wilhelm II was the titular head of the German armed forces, but actual control of the army was exercised by its professional commander-in-chief, Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg, and the general staff, headed by the extremely capable General Erich Ludendorff. But the Kaiser, who saw himself as a great military leader, loved to interfere, and often set up field headquarters where he was able to play court at the front, and to which Hindenburg and Ludendorff would pay lip service. The French shared the information concerning the Kaiser's suspected whereabouts with the British. British intelligence had a network of agents across Europe, including in the Trelon area. The Kaiser's movements could therefore be tracked with a fair degree of accuracy, but this information was not real-time. There was always a delay of a few days, meaning that the Kaiser might have moved from Trelon when any attack was made. But events at the front breathed new urgency into the decision to try and kill the Kaiser. 
In late May 1918, the Germans won a significant victory at Chemin des Dames, 45,000 Allied soldiers falling into German hands. The operation to kill Wilhelm II was hastily greenlit. So why kill the Kaiser? Well, he was a major driver behind the German war effort, and killing the German head of state, and as the Allies saw it, the major warmonger responsible for the conflict, might cause Hindenburg and Ludendorff to see sense, and the government in Berlin to sue for peace. His death would be a major blow to the German people. And the home front, where restlessness was already stirring among a disgruntled, starving and war-weary populace, was sure to get out of control. Germany was teetering on the brink of communist revolution. But conversely, killing the Kaiser might have had a different outcome, that of turning him into a martyr and rallying the German people in a final effort to win World War I. Either way, the order to kill Kaiser Wilhelm II could only have come from the very top of the British establishment, from the Prime Minister himself, David Lloyd George. The Kaiser was, after all, King George V's cousin, such a mission was kept from Buckingham Palace for obvious reasons. It had been decided that the British would carry out the operation in the form of a precision aerial bombing attack on the chateau. The newly formed Royal Air Force would undertake the mission from an airfield at Boulogne. The unit tasked with taking out Kaiser Bill was number 25 Squadron, commanded by 27-year-old Major Chester Duffus an ace Canadian pilot who had shot down five enemy machines in 1916. The aircraft type would be the reliable and effective de Havilland DH-4 bomber, 12 aircraft forming the attack force. For the mission, each aircraft carried two 20-pound Cooper bombs and one 112-pound high-explosive bomb. The 12 DH-4s departed from their airfield near Boulogne at 0450 hours on Sunday the 2nd of June 1918. The aircraft slowly climbed up to 14,000 feet. Interestingly, the squadron had been assigned two targets at Trelon, the Chateau, the Kaiser's military headquarters, and half a mile northwest, a railway branch line where the Emperor's luxurious train was parked on a siding. The idea was that if the house was attacked, the Kaiser might flee to his train, and they would have a second chance to kill him then. Duffers and his men crossed the front lines without incident. There were no German fighters in evidence. And once 25 miles from the targets, began to descend to 500 feet, aware now of the dangers of anti-aircraft fire. 24 men in 12 aircraft with 36 bombs were now ready to change history. Each aircraft dropped down and targeted the chateau or the train, their bombs throwing up huge clouds of smoke and debris, the observers in the rear cockpits hammering away at ground targets with their machine guns. But the low altitude combined with the smoke meant that many of the dozen DH-4s missed the chateau and the train, their bombs landing harmlessly in the grounds or farmland. One DH-4 was shot down by Flack, the pilot forced landing, the pilot and his observer managed to burn their plane before being taken prisoner. The chateau was not damaged, but near misses destroyed several royal and military cars in the courtyard, and Wilhelm's imperial train was riddled by over 800 rounds of .303 ammunition. Major Duffus and his ten other surviving planes arrived back at base at 0635 hours. The question on everyone's lips was obvious. Was the hated emperor dead? Alas, no. The Kaiser had left the Chateau de Trelon by car 19 hours before the attack to travel right to the front lines, and was unharmed. The Kaiser's battle dragged on for several more weeks, both sides suffering a total of one and a half million casualties. However, with the failure of the spring offensives and revolution at home, Kaiser Wilhelm II was forced to abdicate in November 1918, and Germany became a republic. He fled to the Netherlands, where he lived out the rest of his life until his death in June 1941, aged 82, ironically while the Netherlands was under German occupation. Please be sure to check out my film about the exiled Kaiser, link in the end screen. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and share, 
can also visit my new audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton, details below. You can also help support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon, details again in the description box below. Thank you.